Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Jana, for those who don't know, and uh, I am the president of the Dispute the Debo, the organizers of uh, tonight's lecture. And uh, the interests of our dispute usually rely more on the cultural and artistic side, but we also like to explore more social and political issues, which in turn, in our case, often revolve around gender. And so that latter field, along with SIP's more usual international outlook, made for a lovely combination for tonight's topic, which is, to put it quite frankly, the systematic relegating of women to the margins of militaries and peacekeeping missions. Because when you think about it, uh, you know, the military, nine times out of ten, it's kind of a boys' club. Um, but what are the consequences of this? How far do they reach? And can we change them? And how? how could, could it be changed? Loads of questions, uh, but to shine a light on all of this, we have invited Dr. Vanessa Newby. She teaches at the University of Leiden at the Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs and the Institute of Security and Global Affairs. She's also the president of the Netherlands uh, Charter of Women in International Security. And she is the lead researcher for the gender and peace research stream of the chair of UN studies in peace and justice. In other words, she is extremely qualified to teach us more about this topic and her own research surrounding it. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Vanessa Newby. Unmute. <laughs> um, Yana, what a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. Um, so I don't know if I'm qualified actually to talk a lot about this uh, because this field is becoming, is growing exponentially by year on year. Um, and so when we get to the question and answer session, it may well be that I can't answer your question about something um, because it really is quite... Uh, it's quite, it's really becoming a very rich field of inquiry. Um, so today I'm going to discuss the latest research, or at least it was the latest research, Things Move Fast, uh, in when it came out in December, this article, uh, on gender mainstreaming in national militaries and peacekeeping. Uh, and I'm basing it on a paper that I uh, forwarded to, to, to your organization uh, by myself and my colleague Clotilde Sebag. Uh, the argument that I present tonight is really that unless we see an increase in national in women in national militaries, we're not going to see a real increase in women as peacekeepers. Um, and many of you may know that there's been quite a few calls of late from the UN Security Council for increasing women in peacekeeping. Uh, and it, it sort of came across, you know, to me sort of as I was looking at that, I was thinking, well, are there any enough women in national militaries to even, you know, get women in more, more women in peacekeeping, right? Um, and that's when I started to investigate this paper. So this paper started about two years ago. Um, and that's how long anyone who works in academia knows that's about how long it takes to get something published from, from concept through to uh, final approval. Um, uh, of course, in a peer reviewed uh, journal, especially uh, at the current time. But anyway, so um, when I started looking into it, that's why um, I decided to do a sort of scoping uh, paper, if you will, sort of looking at globally, myself and my colleague, you know, where the women were, how many there were and what they were doing. So it's a quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis, not a big inferential statistical analysis because we don't have the data. Uh, but we did a sort of a sort of rough as well as, as detailed as we could spec on on how many women were functioning in in national militaries globally and then also uh unpacking the kind of things that women are doing in the national militaries and then also what they're actually doing in peacekeeping operations as well um and the other kind of key issues i want us to think about is really uh and that we can talk about um that i raise in the paper and that are still very much on my mind uh, the major problem, as I see it, is this instrumentalization of women, or what I call gender side streaming. Um, and by this, I mean there are moves to increase the number of women in military forces and military personnel in peacekeeping, but it hasn't really resulted in gender mainstreaming. Um, rather, we see women being allocated into special spaces. 
Um, so not just sidelined, which is why we didn't just call it sidelining, which someone else I think talked about years ago in another paper, but or mail streaming as it's been called by Laura Schoberg, but actually sort of um, this sign of side streaming where they kind of get shunted into specialized spaces. Um, so they're kind of exceptionalized and ignored at, at the same time, which I think is a really interesting problem for us to overcome. And the second issue is how we manage the problem of how we reconcile the different needs and priorities of men and women when we talk about establishing gender equality in any institution, right? So this definitely goes uh, uh, beyond a security institution. Um, because I think this is a tension that we really haven't worked out yet, you know, so in a, in a minor example will be, you know, women have, for example, specific biological needs, right, that differ from men's, but we constitute 50% of the population. So, you know, how do we reconcile that in an operation where you physically need to be able to do certain things at certain times and you're going to be traveling and, and living, you know, so even as basic as that, like we have to figure out, you know, how do we how do we not see gender as the other, as Simone de Beauvoir would, would, would say, and how do we actually incorporate those different needs into institutions and think more broadly about what constitutes a gender equal, a really gender equal approach within institutions. Um, and for those of you who may be less familiar with this field of, of women, peace and security, as I've said, it's a, it's a growing and rapidly diversifying field, and I can't claim to be an expert in all of it. Um, but I hope I'll be able to give you some overview a little bit of what's going on in that field. And I've just realized I haven't shared my slides, so I should probably do that. <laughs> You're all being so polite. You should have just said like, hey, lady, <laughs> we didn't notice, but I'm share your slides. <laughs> and I apologize because they, yeah, they're not that pretty. Uh, so that was the talking to the first slide. Let me get to the, oh, okay. Now I just have to, I have to click there, do I? Uh, you get the nice sidelining slide over. All right, so what am I actually going to talk about today? Okay, so I'm going to talk about, it'll start with a discussion of a little bit of history of Resolution 1325, which underpins this discussion. Um, and gender mainstreaming, what is it technically? Um, what is side streaming when I talk about that? Um, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit um, about feminism in the military, what, what, what women do in the military, how often and, 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 and where we find them, and then go into talking about women and, and peacekeeping and this special role conundrum that I referred to. Um, and then I'm going to leave you with some questions that are still bothering me and we can, we can talk about them. And for those of you that are less familiar, I would ask you to set aside your idea of what national security or what war is like, because you know, if you really want to think more deeply about what gender and security, about gender and security, you kind of need to shift, we need to shift our thinking on, on what war looks like and what violence is and, and, and what, what, what war and peace actually are. Um, because if we sort of take the kind of masculine ideas of, of, of a physical strength being the determinant of, of, of what war includes, then I think it's much easier just to say, well, this whole inclusion of women doesn't matter because women aren't physically as strong. But the point about that is that you, we really need to broaden our conception of what warfare is or isn't. Um, but we'll get into that later. But uh, just try and keep an open mind for those of you that may, may already be one, wondering about that. Um, so let's go into a little bit about Resolution 1325 and briefly discuss its, comp discuss its components. So I'm assuming most of you, most of you probably know about its existence. You know that um, 1325 uh, was passed in the UN Security Council in 2000, October 31st. We had the 20th anniversary last year of 1325. Um, and it spawned what we call is the WPS agenda, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda which comprises a number of resolutions, national action plans, pillars. I'm going to go through a little bit of that because then you'll just see how extensive this, uh, the material has, has become on this topic. Um, but let's just talk briefly about the key components of 1325. Okay, so the initial resolution 
talked about preventing sexual and gender-based violence in armed conflict. It also talked about a gender perspective in peace negotiations, and in particular, the greater inclusion of women in peace negotiations, which I'm sure you'll all know is still is probably one of the less well-developed uh, aspects of that resolution in that we still have a chronic shortage. And actually, you'll see parallels when I talk about um, the need to kind of adjust our thinking on certain issues. That's something that's been discussed in, in terms of women's inclusion in peace negotiations. There's always this talk, oh, there's not enough qualified women. And it's like, mm, maybe we need to think about what qualifies you <laughs> to participate in a peace negotiation in the first place. Uh, rather than, 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 than blaming the victim and saying, oh, you know, you didn't get far enough up the, the food chain in the UN for us to consider you uh, worthy of that position. So again, it's this sort of starting to rethink the, the institutional design rather than just sort of uh, trying to fix pegs into round holes. Uh, and then we've got the protection of women in refugee settings. Uh, the consideration of women's needs in uh, demobilization, um, reintegration and disarmament initiatives. Um, so women are unfairly penalized and punished when they take part as uh, uh, in armed conflict and are usually rejected uh, in, their, in their home villages or towns when they go back. Uh, there's some fantastic work on this in South Asia, if it interests you, in Sri Lanka and also from Burundi. Uh, in Africa, where some really great researchers have gone in um, to talk about um, the needs of women and how they have been excluded. I've been asked, uh, well, we've talked about this, we're probably going to keep questions to the end, um, unless it's an urgent question. Is that okay? Okay, all right, but please do keep your question. Hold on to it and, uh, and, 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 and ask it at the end. Um, so it also talked about the need for greater women's political participation at state, regional and international levels, the need for gender perspectives in peace operations, uh, greater gender balancing in the UN, um, and that goes across uh, the UN uh, headquarters in New York, as well as uh, in all the, the peace operations um, worldwide. Uh, and other, obviously there's a myriad other functions like special political missions and so forth, and regular reporting on the situation from the UN Secretary General. So it really was a very broad, wide ranging, but basically the idea was that women have different uh, needs and are affected differently by conflict. And we need to, we also need to start including them in how we think about resolving conflict. So um, this, uh, resolution, as I've said, oh, and also gender balancing. Oh, I've said that already. So I was looking at my notes and I missed that. Just to go back briefly, I always never know whether to do this slide before the last one. How did UNSCR 13 come around? Um, well, basically, it was pretty much started by the global south. Um, and so let me just, sorry, there we go. Now I can actually see the slide. Um, and the 1995 Beijing, there was a series of com uh, conferences globally, which you'll know about. There was uh, the Mexico conference, uh, and then I think in the 1970s, and then you'd have to, and then the creation of CEDAW, uh, the Convention on uh, the Rights of Women, and then the Beijing conference uh, for women in 1995, which despite some real challenges, um, initiated the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and Resolution 1325 in 2000. And the reason I want to point to the fact that the Global South was responsible for initiating Resolution uh, 1325 is because, you know, quite frankly, the Global North and countries like the Netherlands and Britain um, tend to uh, speak a great deal about the importance of, you know, women's rights and 1325. And yet in practice, Many states in the global south are actually doing an awful lot more um, on WPS than we are uh, here in Europe. And a lot of that is to do with the fact that European states often project outwards. So they say, oh, we're, we're fine. Gender equality is all good and well in our country. So now we need to help the poor people in other parts of the world who haven't actually achieved that. And of course, there are many countries uh, that we should be very worried about 
uh, in terms of gender equality, um, particularly the latest decision about what's happening in Afghanistan. I am very worried about what's going to happen to women's rights uh, when, when the forever war um, ends. Um, but there's also stuff still going on in our own countries that needs addressing. Um, so I just want to make the point um, as well that there's often, there is a, increasingly, and it's something I'm just starting a project working on, uh, what we call the colonization of the WPS agenda by the global north. So what we're seeing as well um, with the um, with how the agenda is being interpreted is actually being driven uh, in many ways by the global north because that's where the funding's coming from. But then they have a very specific idea about what the WPS agenda and what women's equality should look like. And that may not correspond to the experience of women on the ground. Now, this is a whole other topic. So I, I don't want to kind of go off too much on that because, you know, the cultural relativism and so forth and, and what people are comfortable with. But I'm not really talking about that here. What I'm really talking about when I talk about sort of the, the takeover of the WPS agenda by the global north at the expense of the global south is this idea that, you know, it's often treated by global north practitioners and the UN uh, represents that oftentimes, despite being a global institution, um, as being a kind of technocratic thing that can just be applied, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that the WPS actually agenda, um, the actual application, I mean, for many women uh, in, in, in parts of the global South, whether it's South Asia or Africa or Southeast Asia or Latin America, have considerable constraints within their own country and have to fight just to be able to leave the house and actually initiate any of these of these uh, policies. And so sometimes, and, and it becomes very political. So it's not a technocratic kind of thing, right? Right, you've got your national action plan, you'll go off and do that. So all of which is to say, um, the Global South had a big role in establishing uh, UNSC uh, uh, Resolution 1325. Um, and it's currently still doing an awful, awful lot. There's, there's, it, it's, it's very underreported how much peace building work uh, is being done at the local level that incorporates uh, 1325. Um, but it's often being kind of talked about by the global north and at UN headquarters in a certain way that doesn't necessarily match what's the reality of what's going on. And this is another massive shortage in the literature that I myself and, and a colleague are trying to, to work on resolving um, to bring more um, global south uh, activists and practitioners and academics into a cohort um, working on WPS so that we can find out more about what's actually going on on the ground. So um, that was how it started. And as you can see, the NGO working group on women, peace and security was significant, um, but Namibia in particular uh, played a huge role. And of course, one of the major declarations um, within that, that triggered 1325 was called the Windhoek Declaration and the Namibia Plan of Action that triggered the resolution. And since that resolution uh, was launched, nine more resolutions came about, plus one, which is not technically regarded as part of the WPS agenda. And I can't really remember why, but I put it down there because it's very related to peacekeeping and it talks about, it's launched by Indonesia, asking for more inclusion of women in peacekeeping. Indonesia has some very specific interests uh, in, in increasing the number of women in peacekeeping. But if you read my paper, you'll find that they also um, have some rather interesting practices that are not necessarily compatible with gender equality uh, in national militaries. Now, given I, I was saying, oh, my talk's going to be short, I'd see already it's nearly 20 past, uh, it's just gone 20 past eight. So moving on, I'm not going to go through all these resolutions, couldn't if I wanted to, because I get very confused about which one says what. But um, it's all online. If you go to peacewomen.org, by the way, it's a fantastic resource. They have all the national action plans, they have all, all this stuff, so you can actually uh, look into all of it. But what I want to talk about in this particularly is that up until 2015, okay, so what I'm trying to give you here is not just an overview of the depth of material, but also the kind of trends that we're seeing in WPS now. So we're seeing a kind of takeover from the global north and a kind of prioritization of global north objectives. But what we also saw up until 2015, which is changing now, hence my article and many, many others, um, is a focus away from protection and prevention and more towards participation. So 
a lot of the resolutions that you see on the screen now, uh, with the exception of 1889, was really, really talk. Well, I mean, it did include protection, but we're really talking about, oh, how can we protect women? So you still have this kind of dichotomy of, oh, women are the other and women are helpless and we must all protect them and they need to be a big, strong men to protect. Them. You see what I mean? And again, this taps into the point I raised at the beginning where that you've got this tension between, you know, wanting to treat women equally, but also understanding that women have specific needs uh, or problems, especially in, in, in conflict, uh, that require specialized attention, specialized vulnerabilities, um, and so forth. But this became problematic because, yeah, ultimately up until about 2015, you know, feminists across the world started saying, well, hang on a minute, you're still talking about women in this way. And, you know, what about participation? What about us being included? Um, what about us being able to help prevent the very conflicts that we're suffering from the most? Um, and then, so now things have changed a little bit in the sense that there's been more empowerment and that includes empowerment of survivors. So the Dennis McQuaidji Foundation, for example, very uh, important in talking about survivors instead of victims. Um, and an, a great deal uh, of uh, calls and particularly um, Resolution 2050, uh, 2242, but also the uh, two significant reports whose names escape me currently, um, that call again for more participation of women in national militaries and peacekeeping and so forth. And just when you thought, my goodness, how many more documents is she going to throw in our face? You see, hopefully you're getting some idea now of the depth of this field. I mean, it's just, it's just there's so much, you know, you could spend a year just reading all this stuff. On top of all these detailed resolutions, we also have what we call the four pillars uh, of 1325, which are prevention, protection, participation, and relief and recovery. And to give you an overview of that, as I said, prevention and protection have received the most attention thus far. Participation is fast becoming uh, uh, recognized as being much more important. But what that actually means on the ground, we're still trying to figure out. And then relief and recovery is probably the least uh, looked at. And uh, if you uh, are familiar with the work of Jackie True uh, down in Monash in Australia with her WPS center there, she talks a lot about how this uh, actually really holds the key to the transformation of women's lives because WPS was really intended to be transformative. Yeah, it was supposed to make, have, a, have an effect that after conflict, women have the opportunity to participate equally in society, or at least that was the idea of a lot of, a lot of the, the people who started it. Rather than sort of just temporarily protecting women, it was about, okay, how can we transform women and make them full and complete citizens um, in terms of national security? Um, so the main point from this is that Resolution 1889 established these four pillars. Now, why are these four pillars useful? Well, for a number of reasons. Um, states use them when they're drafting their national action plans. Um, there are currently 92 countries that have adopted national action plans on WPS, so we're getting a lot closer to saturation point. This has even jumped up. I mean, it's jumping up faster because when I first reported on this, it was 83 countries, and that was only five months ago. So now we have 92 with national action plans. Um, however, there's lots of critiques of national action plans, so I'm not going to say that that's, that's the be-all and end-all of WPS implementation, far from it. Um, some are funded, some are not. So they have a national action plan and maybe it looks all nice and shiny, but then nobody does anything. So, you know, it's, 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 it's not a silver bullet. The Netherlands is very advanced. You're already on their fourth iteration. They launched a couple of uh, weeks ago, the fourth iteration of a um, couple of weeks, couple of months ago of the national action plans. Um, so some countries are only just launching them. Some are already uh, renewing and revising their action plans. But these four pillars, uh, a lot around what informs those national action plans. And national action plans are useful, why? Because NGOs and people actually involved in implementing the, this, uh, this uh, agenda on the ground can hold governments accountable 
and say, look, here are the indicators and you haven't met any of them. So for example, specific indicators might include tracking numbers related to outcomes, such as the number of women in peace negotiations, the number of military manuals that include measures on women's protection, or the number of cases investigated on violence against women. So these are the kind of indicators that are incorporated within each of these pillars. And again, if you want a comprehensive review of that, if you're interested in sort of you know, content analyses, go on to the resolution and they're all listed, all those indicators there. Um, so, right, now I've given you uh, a bit of a backdrop uh, and you've got some idea, hopefully, of what people mean when they talk about the WPS agenda and just how rich and deep the, the, the policy making material is on it. Um, and, you know, if you see the research, poof, it's uh, exploded. Let's just have a quick definition of what we actually mean by mainstreaming. Now, when I got into this field, I have to say that I assumed that when everyone was talking about gender mainstreaming, there was a United Nations Security Council definition, right? Because WPS 1325 mentions gender mainstreaming, gender mainstreaming, gender mainstreaming. Everyone's talking about gender mainstreaming. And then I actually found the definition in the national and the UN ECO, ECOSOC. Economic and Social Council. That's where the actual definition was lodged. So and in 1997. So the United Nations Security Council never actually bothered to create their own definition. And so you find this uh, definition kind of wedged uh, in ECOSOC after some digging, I might add. Um, so what's the definition? Now I have to minimize you all just so I can read it myself. The process of assessing the implications for women and men of any planned action, including legislation, policies or programs in all areas and at all levels. It's a strategy for making women's as well as men's concerns and experiences an integral dimension of the design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of policies and programs in all political, economic and societal spheres so that women and men benefit equally and inequality is not perpetuated. The ultimate goal is to achieve gender equality. Gender mainstreaming does not replace the need for targeted women-specific policies and programs or positive legislation, nor does it substitute for gender units or gender focal points. Okay, so as you can see, uh, fairly clear when it comes to talking about um, political, social, and economic, they don't actually mention security. So it's a little bit weird that Resolution 13 5, 1325 was launched, but no specific gender mainstreaming in relation to security uh, description was launched at the same time, which is kind of funny. Okay, so now when I talk about gender side streaming, what did I base it on? Well, as I've said, a sort of combination of specializing women and actually sidelining them. So in the paper, uh, when, I, when I realized this was happening, when I examined women's participation in national militaries um, and uh, peacekeeping, I realized that this practice was going on. And I talked with my co-author, Clotilde, and I said, oh, you know, what do we what do we call this? You know, it's kind of like sidelining, but it's kind of also not like they're trying to. So we came up with gender side streaming. Probably we could have been much more imaginative, but there you go. I think it captures the term uh, well. So it's a practice, deliberate or unintentional, this is how we define it at least, of sidelining women and relegating them to specialized spaces in international peace and security while attempting gender mainstreaming or increased gender integration. So that's how we sort of came up with uh, what we think it is. Um, and that's really what I want to talk to you about today. So um, before we get on to what's actually going on in national militaries, I thought um, it would be uh, as well just to give you an idea of what, you remember I talked about the Windhoek Declaration early on, which underpinned Resolution 1325, Namibia's uh, plan of action. Um, what you often find nowadays when people talk about mainstreaming in the military, and NATO talks about it endlessly, um, is that they kind of raise questions that actually were already answered in the original document, which is why I bring this up. Because if you go back, and this is always the case in IR at least, you know, you actually go back and look and someone's actually talked about it already and then everyone ignored them or, you know, rolled on in their policy making further and forgot that actually things had already been discussed and technically agreed. And so what we find here is that often NATO will say, oh, you know, but the problem is promotion or this or that. And it's like, well, actually, this was all covered off on. So 
you know, you don't need to say that this is a, a new problem. This is something that they'd already thought about. So one of the reasons uh, it's quite frustrating um, when people talk about, for example, the lack of qualified women to do certain positions, um, in the military context, this was taken, taken care of. So the Windhoek Declaration stressed the need to increase the number of women in military and police forces at all levels. And they talked about the need to encourage troop contributing countries, so TCCs are troop contributing countries, to develop long term strategies to increase the number of female personnel in the national armed forces. So the Window Declaration was way ahead of 2015 resolutions asking for more female peacekeepers. They already said, look, you're going to have to have more women in peacekeeping. You can't just have men walking around in, in military uniforms and say that that's a representation of what peace should look like, you know, like, come on, or war indeed. Uh, and the need to assess eligibility requirements for senior roles in the military. And that specifically relates to things that come up shortly. Um, well, I'll, I'll mention shortly it comes up because one of the biggest criticisms uh, and problems for women getting promoted is the fact that they often don't have frontline experience. Now, the reason for that is that many states do not allow women to fight on the front line. I mean, the UK, for example, only gave women permission in 2016 to, to perform all roles. But if you go back and look at the work of uh, actually a Dutch scholar, de Groot, he actually was talking about this a while ago, that during World War II, British women were serving on the front line and the only, as gunners, but they weren't actually allowed to fire the weapon, but they pointed it and targeted it. And then a man would actually have to fire the weapon because the British army could not be seen to have women on the front line. Now, why was that? Oh, because it was regarded as unfeminine. Uh, cultural norms at the time was that war was a space for men and not for women. So you can see that women actually were performing and in many African states actually already do perform on the front line. But some states, and actually this is again goes back to my point about Northern Europe not being any more advanced. Northern European states are far more squeamish about allowing their women to fight than, than, than other parts of the world, quite frankly. Um, and yet, the, uh, the upshot of that was that even though women fought on the front lines during the war, they didn't receive any medals or recognition for, for what they'd done because technically they weren't pulling, pulling the trigger, which was the technicality the army introduced in order to, to disallow women to fight on the front line. And then, you know, 2016, we finally see women uh, being allowed to, to fight on the front line. But these kind of technicalities are what are holding women up, basically. And it's amazing how petty people get. So, for example, I was speaking to um, the, a gender advisor at UN Women who was a military uh, guy um, from Australia. And I used my Australian connections to, to have a conversation and interview with him. And he said to me, as an experienced soldier of, 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 of many years, he just said to me, you know what I find really confusing about all this? He said, it's the fact that, you know, you, there's a strength test because there's a piece of equipment when you're on the front line that you need to be able to lift. He said, but most guys can't lift it. Usually there's two of them who lift it together. He said, you know, so at the end of the day, like, why do we, why do we set this as a, as a physical bar, you know, when, you know, so only very tall or, or, or women would be able to, to do that when uh, there's an awful lot of smaller guys around who also can't, can't lift this kind of stuff. So he made the point about the, these futile arrangements that really with a little bit of planning, you can say, OK, we need some big people and we need some smaller people in every contingent. Um, so but that's it. Not everybody's going to be able to do that task, especially when you consider that a fitness test, you know, you have them every year, but you might build up enough strength to do that once. But after a year, you might not even be able to do it. So it all becomes a bit redundant. But the issue of equipment is a whole big issue in the military. And I, I'm not going to talk about it now, but we can maybe talk about it um, later um oh i did want to talk to you about that but I'll, I'll i'll put that aside and if i've got time i'll come back to uh if we have a discussion about physical strength and war because it's a really interesting topic um okay so women in the military all right so i'm going to flip through these because um it's in the article i attached but this is just to whoopsie this is just to give you an overview and an idea of uh the data that we collected um, from a variety of sources to try and find out, you know, where women were in national militaries. And as you can see, the percentages are very, very low uh, in all countries. Although, interestingly, 
you'll see that they are more represent, better represented in other parts of the world than they are in Europe. I mean, the numbers in Europe are very low compared to the countries uh, I showed you, but uh, we'll flip through them and, you know, um, we can come back to them later or just look at the paper because they're all there uh, as well. Um, but I think it's really interesting just to pause a minute on Europe to see that, you know, not only are the numbers very low with the exception of Hungary, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about Hungary in a bit in a minute, but not only are they very low, but you have countries at the forefront of, uh, of gender parity. So countries like Norway, where they've been encouraging women to join the, the armed forces for years, and Denmark that opened up all roles and positions to women in 1992, yet you still see very low participation. So that's when you realize something more is going on, right? It's not just about the fact that they're banned and that women aren't allowed to, to do these things. There's, there's, there, there's more stuff going on in the uh, institutions themselves, excuse me. So now let's take a look at what is actually going on. So there we have the Middle East and North Africa. Israel, obviously a bit of an exception to that role. Fantastic book, by the way, um, on Israeli military women came out last year with Oxford University Press. Uh, Harriet uh, uh, Shalev and Daphne Tekoa, something like that, uh, talking about women's experiences using narrative analysis in, in, in the military. Really great book. Um, okay, so let's now look qualitatively at what women are actually doing in the military then. So what we found through our research is that, you know, non-combat positions uh, are treated as lower status. According to NATO reports, 33.1% of service women in member states are employed in non-combat services and supply corps such as technicians, military assistants, planning and management professionals, load masters, different specialists, et cetera. So immediately there you've got an idea of what's going on. Uh, in order to get promoted, you kind of need to have served on the front line or in combat, but most women tend not to do that. And as I've already said, oftentimes we're not permitted to do that. And I would say as well that, you know, even I don't know if there's a film out that you can probably now watch on YouTube, YouTube, but by a Ukrainian army who are obviously fighting the war in Russia. And there are women there serving on the front line. And the Ukrainian army, I think they've stopped it now because of this film, but they were sort of assigning them titles like chief, uh, chief clothes maker or something. And they were actually serving on the front line fighting. But the army, again, the military did not want to acknowledge uh, their presence on the front line. So this was a it's a documentary about the lives of women fighting on the front line in Ukraine uh, that came out a couple of years ago. It's 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 a little bit long, but it's it's if you're interested in that stuff, it's it's worth a it's worth a look because you see how they're sort of made invisible by the institution itself. Um, and so what you have the problem in all of this is, yeah, where you have these these status attached to these professions. Um, and again, I really refer you to de Groot's work because he has a very powerful paper on that, which I can, if anyone's interested, I can send the reference afterwards, um, where he really talks about how positions and roles are constructed within militaries. So for example, in war hundreds of years ago, women and children, in fact, would be part of the, the camp, you know, the military camp. They would be maybe cooking or mending clothes or whatever, but they would actually be part of the military operation in terms of actually providing things that nobody can do without. A soldier, an army marches on its stomach. That's one of the oldest expressions, right? Um, but the interesting thing is, is that nowadays, if a man works as a cook in a kitchen and he's in the army, he's treated as a soldier. He's not treated as a side, a side party. But, you know, in those days, women were treated as you know part of the military camp but not really recognized as soldiers so the argument he makes is that oftentimes the way we define roles and we see this across the board actually with 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 the feminizing of certain work positions right they're regarded as something that men don't do and that women do and i'm not talking about you know being a housewife i'm talking about you know whether you work maybe in public relations or which is often seen as much more of a female sort of thing so again you have this feminizing of specific roles within the military um and the masculinizing of other roles um and so you've got hungary's female workforce clustered around the ministry of defense 
In Algeria and Australia, service women tend to be concentrated in health roles, so nursing and doctors. In Argentina, women are largely uh, concentrated in the professional core across three branches of the armed forces. So they serve in professional fields such as law, medicine, biochemistry, system analytics, etc. Within the PLA, in China, women traditionally served in medical communications, logistics support, academic and propaganda roles. And these women are often not sent on peacekeeping missions because the preference is usually to send combat troops. So again, you have an issue where you might have a high representation of women in other roles, but when militaries are requested for TCCs, they're looking for patrolling troops, right? So military personnel tend to get drawn from frontline troops. So again, you see less women being sent. So this is also um, a bit of a problem. There's other problems as well, and, and a very detailed uh, paper came out not long, just before we published, but we were under review at the time. In fact, we think we're making our changes by Lottie Vermai, who interviewed 152 uh, military women. And there are other reasons, of course, why women don't uh, go into the field, uh, which we'll touch on later. But um, part of the problem is also just, you know, um, not thinking uh, uh, until recently, not really thinking, OK, how can we include more women? It's like, OK, we need a, a battalion that patrols. OK, so we'll, we'll take troops from the front line. Um, so what are the what are the what are the problems like why are we seeing so few women why are we seeing women in these specific positions is it just about feminization of certain roles so they don't feel comfortable entering other positions uh what's really going on and so uh, you know i can't tell you that i can give you any answers i can tell you what we you know that are definitive uh you know no experiments were conducted <laughs> uh but what we did find indications of is there was a lack of promotion opportunities, as I've said, because of non-combat status. Um, so in many cases, as I've said, until recently, women weren't allowed to take part in frontline operations or were not picked for combat operations. Um, women view a military career often as being incompatible with having a family. Um, so, a major reason cited for women's departure, a retention issue from the military is that they might join and they might do very, very well, um, but the difficulty of balancing military life with a family life uh, comes into view and women largely view a military career as being incompatible with having a family owing to the rigidity of the career path. Um, and as a result, some women view the military as a more short-term career option. Now it's true that there are some women who might well strategically do that, but we also have to ask ourselves why women seem to still be shouldering the majority of childcare. Why is it not a men and women's problem? Why is it a woman's problem? Uh, that, and also why is the institution not seemingly able to prevent women from feeling this way? And what we found is that, um, and not us, but also we were drawing on, we were secondary researchers, so we were drawing on primary research is that a lot of these views come from uh, women's experience with their uh, senior officers who uh, have not made them feel, the environment has not made them feel comfortable asking for leave to look after their family or for negotiating around their family demands. Now, it's not all women. I mean, I have a very good friend who serves in the Dutch military who's never had that problem uh, and told me cheerfully, she's really got a fantastic senior officer. Uh, where I tell you it does, from what I could find out, does seem to be very prevalent is in the US military. Uh, a book I read firsthand by uh, Mary Jane Hagar, I recommend it. Uh, her experience was that she was asked by one of her bosses why she wasn't at home looking after her husband and why another one asked her why she was stealing a job that rightfully belonged to a man and she was a pilot. Um, so, you know, coming up against those, those kind of things, a lot of women will say, do you know what? Like, it's too hard basket, I'll go and do something else. Um, so these are some of the some of the reasons. Um, so mentorship plays a big role. And uh, when you're talking about um, recruitment, so you've got that problem in retention and in recruitment, advertisements still rely very heavily on masculine imagery. And John Beth, Jean Beth Elstein uh, coined the phrase beautiful warrior, sorry, beautiful soul, noble warrior. Um, and this sort of dichotomizing of what a woman is and what a man is and what war and peace are and so forth. And this orthodoxy is still kind of entrenched by a lack of willingness to portray women in active warfare, portray women as even being violent. Um, and that's a whole bigger issue, uh, bigger than uh, what I'm talking about today. 
Um, but a much more basic sort of issue is the fact that, you know, if women don't see other women in senior positions, they're not going to feel as motivated. They're going to say, well, you can't, you know, there is a glass ceiling and you can't get beyond it. Furthermore, even at places like recruitment offices, if you don't have women on the desks there to answer women's questions, which will be quite specific about certain things, you know, what do I do about this or what happens if that? you know, women, women won't ask those questions and maybe put off from joining. So even something as basic as that uh, can sort of help improve uh, recruitment. Uh, given time, let's move on now to women and peacekeeping. So those are just some of the, some of the findings. They all connect to much bigger issues with society, bottom line, but anyway. So peacekeeping, well, how well has peacekeeping fared in terms of implying 1325, a UN resolution to UN peacekeeping. Well, we don't see too much change in terms of since resolution 1325 took place. So between, from the data that we could obtain, between 1989 and 1993, just 1.7% 1 of military peacekeepers deployed by the UN were female. By 2001, the share of women in military posts, military posts serving in UN missions had increased only to little more than 4%. Currently, the number of female troops serving in peace operations abroad as uniformed military personnel, I'm not talking about civilian uh, officers here, constitute 4.8% of all peacekeeping troops. Um, and as I say, um, in police, they are more represented. It's about 13 or 16% in police. And it's a very interesting question around why you tend to find more female police officers uh, serving abroad than you do um, in military. Moving swiftly on now. So I've talked a lot about the negatives and, and how hard it is for women. Why, do, why, why are they so in demand in peacekeeping? Well, because they have an awful lot of abilities that transcend, uh, well, further the effectiveness, shall we say? Now, that's a complicated argument, but they further the effectiveness in peace operations in particular. Um, in particular, because you're not actually searching for combat in peacekeeping, right? You're actually searching for peace. Um, and the benefits of having female peacekeepers are that they're able to access women-only spaces. So, for example, they can search women in conservative cultures. Uh, they also have access to the non-elite population in conservative cultures. So where you have a population where women might be uh, a lot more confined to the home and other sort of social spheres other than out on the street, uh, female peacekeepers are able to enter those spaces and understand what their wishes are for a peace process, which is incredibly important. But I must add that um, my good friend Ella, who is the gender advisor for the Chief of Defence now, currently in the Netherlands, and who's been doing this work for a long time, uh, both uh, for the UNIFIL mission in Lebanon, but also in Afghanistan um, uh, for the NATO mission there, um, what she said to me uh, is in Afghanistan, the women couldn't wait to talk to her. It's just that nobody had even bothered to come and talk to them, you know, and they were very, very motivated. And they had an awful lot of ideas and organizations that they that they wanted to bring the attention of the military forces uh, to. Um, and so having a woman in that role enabled uh, the mission to tap into and that side of the population. And as a result, they're better at intelligence gathering. Because, I mean, I, I, I can say this as well as someone who spent probably the best part of four or five years in the Middle East now uh, doing my own research um, on peacekeeping. You know, men will always talk to you as, as, as a strange woman. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm getting on now. It's not such a problem. But, you know, when you're younger, <laughs> they all want to talk to you. Um, now, not so much, but they'll still talk to you. Um, it's just easier because they don't want to flirt with you. Um, <laughs> but the men also, uh, the women also want to talk to you. So you really get a 360 perspective. And that's something that I realized, you know, especially when I was in Yemen. I mean, this was uh, unrelated to my research, but, you know, the women would come up to my, me and my friend and say, how are you? Are you doing OK? Can we help you with anything? And I was out on a trekking tour one day with a, with a Swiss guy and he just said, you guys are so lucky, like they won't talk to me there. I can't, I can't access 50% of the population. You know, I can't talk to, to these women. You're so lucky you get to find out, you know, about their lives. So um, from an intelligence point of view, uh, being a woman is, is very, very helpful um, in conservative cultures. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you ever heard this, but having a female bouncer in a nightclub is often much more effective than having a male one. 
for some reason, uh, we can be uh, very effective. And again, a bit stereotypical, but we're better at diffusing tension. So they've been found to be very helpful in that way. Um, and obviously, in cases of CRSV, uh, CRSV and SEA, so conflict related sexual violence and sexual abuse and exploitation, uh, women having a woman to talk to um, can be incredibly useful. Uh, well, I mean, it can be more than useful. It can be uh, life saving for women who might not feel comfortable in certain cultures talking to a man about that. Um, and again, they can uh, assist more easily with security sector reform and disarmament, uh, demobilization, rehabilitation. And they can also serve as a role model. They're believed to serve as a role model to empower local women to see what else they can do. Now, I can speak to that a little bit in the sense that when I was doing my research in South Lebanon, um, I found that uh, a group of, uh, I stopped and informally talked to a group of uh, women who were sorting tobacco. There's a lot of tobacco grown in South Lebanon. And um, they brought up the subject of the Spanish peacekeepers, the female Spanish peacekeepers. And they were like, wow, we really want to talk to them. They look so tough. And, and one of them's like, yeah, but they also look really sexy, you know, but they got lipstick. And then, you know, so it was just women seeing other women and thinking, what is your life like? You know what I mean? But I've actually got a PhD uh, student at the moment looking at the topic of whether or not this is actually really a thing because again this is something the UN says oh yes you know they're gonna they're gonna spread the message that you know seeing women in these in these important roles will make them have more ambition or whatever but in fact um we don't know that um we don't know that this is actually the case so um I think this is something we need to unpack more about the effect of female peacekeepers on the female local population um, there is also an assumption which Olivera Simic, uh, an Australian researcher, challenged recently, and rightfully so, that you know, if you've got women troops uh, in a male contingent, the male soldiers will behave better. But obviously that's very contentious because why is it a woman's responsibility to get men to behave better? You know, so there's there's a bit of dissent on, on that point. But these are the these are the findings in the research predominantly. Um, but there's also constraints, uh, just as I talked about in the military, you've got uh, oftentimes peace operations will deploy special forces brigades, which rarely contain women because they haven't been open to women uh, until recently. Force commanders in the past have prevented female peacekeepers from patrolling. Um, we do see now that some nationalities prevent women from leaving the base. So even though they send female peacekeepers, they won't let them patrol, which is just tragic. Um, Again, even when on patrol, uh, anyone who's interested in Annika Kronzel and Annika Bergman Rosamond have done some fantastic work on this around 2012 and 2014, looking at uh, Danish uh, female peacekeepers in Afghanistan. They found that the men often tried to stop them from going into certain areas or talking to certain people uh, so they wouldn't be in harm's way. Um, oftentimes in the past, women have been less likely to be deployed to areas with low development and high violence. But of course, that can often coincide where there's high levels of conflict related sexual violence where women are often needed the most. Um, conversely, they uh, researchers found that troop co uh, contributing countries that have uh, conflict at home often send more women on peace operations because they want to retain their best troops uh, for the home front fight. So that's kind of an interesting twist. I don't know what that tells us about anything other than the sexism of those countries but anyway just always put that in I think it was interesting um, and sexual harassment can be a significant problem so one of the biggest studies on female peacekeepers in 2017 was by Kareem Sabrina Kareem who's also doing a massive project now on this topic uh, Carl Birdsley and they found that 17% of women listed sexual harassment within the mission as the biggest challenge when completing their duties. So, you know, never mind about protecting women from the other, the bad people outside the compound, within the compound, you get these problems. And um, I can talk more about uh, that in questions if anyone's interested in the whole issue of sexual abuse and exploitation, uh, which is the name given for sexual harassment. Well, actually, sexual harassment doesn't come under SEA, actually, forget that. That is not even, that isn't even given a label in the UN, but what we do see is that within UN troops, women who are um, performing uh, their duties are affected by this in within their own troops and within the base itself. Um, 
So some of the, the minimal research that's been done on women's experience of being peacekeepers, women often feel isolated socially and left out of the boys' club of military life. So they're on the compound, they're in the minority. Um, they're restricted often by colleagues when out on patrol, as I mentioned. They often feel pressurized to dress in a less feminine manner as that might make them look more sexual and they don't want to sort of sexualize themselves. They want to be seen as one of the team. Um, often they end up with feelings of low self-esteem due to perceptions of the importance of physical strength. Again, we can talk more about that in questions. Um, they can have reduced opportunities. As I said, they can be victims of sexual harassment. And they can often feel under scrutiny. As something that came up in my interviews, my own uh, interviews with female uh, peacekeepers is that, you know, everyone's eyes are on you. So they say, yeah, I'll go out for a run on base. And then the next day, I'll just be walking into the office. Oh, I saw you out on your run yesterday. And you realize that everyone's kind of noticing you in a way they don't uh, male colleagues. So when you feel sort of on display that, you know, and in, in a funny way, you can say, oh, wow, I feel, you know, like everyone's, you know, notices, but it's a very negative experience. If you feel that people are sort of holding you to a certain standard um, and they're going to be watching to make sure that you adhere to that standard. And uh, Leslie Pruitt, who investigated the all women's uh, UN battalion in uh, uh, police keeping uh, battalion in um, Liberia, Leslie Pruitt, she found that women don't experience these feelings, obviously, when it's an all women uh, unit. So very quickly, then I'm nearly done. Um, and I'm only oh so far one minute over time. The special role of women. This is something that just kept coming up for me when I was doing this research. It was just, you know, what's going on here? On the one hand, we want women to be treated equally. On the other hand, they can do things in certain spaces that men can't. And on the other hand, you know, there's a tension then between wanting gender equality and utilizing the special skills of women. And Susan Willett describes this situation as being both idealized and undervalued at the same time. Um, and Cronsell complained in, in her research as well that, that women are being instrumentalized for niche tasks. So the idea is that, yes, we do want more women, but we don't really want to treat them like men. We kind of want to treat them like special. And again, coming back to Simone de Beauvoir, the other, the niche. So men are the norm and women are the niche. And this is something that, that, that permeates all research on feminism. This idea that even though we're 50% of the population, we're still treated as we're niche and men are the norm. So this is why until recently, you remember, there was a big there were big scandals about the fact that a lot of drugs uh, in the medical profession were never tested on women. Why? Because women's hormones were considered too troublesome. So it was just easier to do it on a male cohort. And, and how some of the most intelligent minds in the world couldn't figure that that was going to present problems for 50 percent of the population when they took those drugs is, is just beyond me. But, you know, these are the kind of uh, things that get overlooked when you start to think in this very narrow way and think, oh, you know, it's just easier to uh, make these assumptions instead of unpacking and questioning, you know, what, what effect those assumptions are going to have. Um, so, I mean, the question for me is like, it's difficult, right? Because on the one hand, you've got these very conservative environments where men do not have access, where women can be incredibly helpful. So where you're talking about conflict related sexual violence or whether you're just talking about everyday kind of comings and goings of, of, of women in, in the market and you want your soldiers to be able to talk to them, right, to make them feel comfortable. Um, so how do you say, OK, well, you're instrumentalizing women and they're not getting the full range of their opportunities. But at the same time, there's just even though we can train men to do those jobs at the same time, how are they actually going to do them in societies where gender equality is not regarded as the norm? Yeah. So for me, this is just still a really big question. Um, and I, I get why it's frustrating to be told, well, you're a woman, so you're going to do these kind of roles on peacekeeping. But I also get why it's important. So that to me is really a tension um, that I think, well, we know is, is, is deeply unresolved. So to finish, uh, you know, these are the questions that still, you know, pervade my mind, having done this kind of very broad survey of lots of countries and trying to dig up as much evidence as I could find, which at the time of writing was incredibly limited. It's definitely expanding now. Is it, what does gender equality look like in national militaries and peacekeeping then? What can we say a gender equal environment would actually look like? And how do we treat everyone equally, but accommodate our differences? So how do we say women are no different to men and men are no different to women? 
And yet we know that in some spaces, women have a unique contribution to make. And I'm not even here talking, obviously, about, you know, whether or not you can speak to women in a marketplace or go into a women only mosque. I'm talking about the idea that obviously women as a group may have different views on what is required in a security situation. And I don't think we've even started really to understand what that means um, in terms of how women envisage human security and, and, and national security, um, because we're still deeply underrepresented in security institutions globally. So how do we utilize women's special skills without side streaming them? And how can we also, on, a, on the larger topic of what a military might need, we also need to start thinking, okay, how do we, how do we think about war and peace? And is an, a display of physical strength the only way to demonstrate to win in a war? Or, or is that what war should comprise? Um, and I, I'll, I'll draw you to the last point, actually, that I was worried I wouldn't have time for. But I think it's important. Sorry, I'm going to have to turn my light on. I do apologize. My light has completely, the light has faded. And I can't read my own notes. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so this masculine ideas of what war comprises and, and what strength looks like, um, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there's a really interesting article by a guy called Richard Price, and it's in a very good journal called International Organization. I'm sure some of you will, will know that journal. And he wrote about, this is years ago, he wrote an interesting article about uh, the censure of chemical weapons. And he said, you know, why is the norm against chemical weapons so strong? Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, lots of killing techniques kill as many people indiscriminately. You know, indiscriminate strafing and bombing and drone attacks can also kill innocent people. So why are we so against chemical weapons? And he comes up with an anecdote about the use of poison during Victorian times in Britain. And women, because it was very difficult to get divorced, women would often, if they were really in an unhappy marriage, resort to the use of poison to kill their husbands. Um, so it became a bit of a thing. Uh, and men started to get worried. And so the powers that be, who of course were men, uh, put a very heavy pejorative sort of slant on the use of poison, on you know, access to poison. But it was interesting and it was called a woman's, a woman's, the woman's uh, kill, uh, killing technique or something. But it's interesting, isn't it? How it was okay to have a manly duel or a sh show of force to kill someone. But somebody killing someone without the use of physical force was seen as a very negative thing. So I think it's, it really sort of leads back. I don't know if you're staying with me on this point, because, but really, you know, it leads back to how we conceive of what conflict and combat is really about. And why was it so offensive that women were able to do this without uh, using that, you know, without being, needing to show their, their physical strength? So I just think um, that's the kind of thinking that we need to think about when we start questioning amongst ourselves, like, hang on a minute, what do we mean when we talk about war and, 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 and killing? And, you know, I mean, I'd like to see it all stop, but, you know, um, there's, a, there's a real bias there. So now I just finally want to do a little bit of spruiking for those of you that have gone the course, just to say I am the president for Women in International Security, Netherlands National Branch. Um, for students, it is free to join, just show that you're a registered student. And what that gives you is a membership of WISE Global, which normally you would pay $50 uh, to join. That's, I think, the student price. Um, and that means you get access to their blogs, job advertisements, lots of internships, uh, podcasts, uh, live uh, events, you know, web events, and of course, all of ours, which we're gradually increasing. We've had two events thus far. We're building up, of course, we launched during COVID. So, you know, it's been a little bit slower than we would have liked. We will be having live events and would certainly like to come and do some live events uh, up in Groningen when we're able to do that again. Um, and you'll be able to uh, elevate your professional. If you've got a blog you want to write, you can also publish it. Uh, on WISE Global Site. So by joining us, um, you'll see the link there. We've got a website. We're embedded at Leiden University, but all students across the Netherlands, uh, it's free. And um, that's our Twitter and that's our uh, thing on LinkedIn. And then finally, I'm gonna do one last spruik for my own work, which is uh, two books that I've written. So if you're interested in my work or anything that you want to find me on, uh, my profile is there at Leiden. 
Um, as I said, I'm President Wise and I'm an assistant professor. I focus on peace building so, and peacekeeping. So my book, uh, Peacekeeping in South Lebanon, was uh, an interpretive piece of work that I did interviewing local people and the UNIFIL mission on uh, how peacekeeping worked in uh, between uh, Lebanon and Israel. Um, that's my uh, academic work. And my book is just coming out, Follow the Arabic Road, Going Off Track in the Middle East. And that's all about the year I spent uh, learning Arabic in Syria uh, in 2010 to 2011. So it's not academic. It's very much a hands-on. I arrived and thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? Uh, so if you're into a tongue-in-cheek look at what it's like to travel across the Middle East, I don't take myself too seriously, uh, then please uh, keep an eye out for it. It's coming out soon. Um, I will stop there. And thank you for your patience. Uh, I know I said, oh, it might only be 45 minutes. And here we are, uh, over an hour long. <laughs> I'll just uh, get rid of the slides. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Newby, for that great lecture. Uh, I learned a lot and also some unexpected and maybe even shocking things about women uh, in peacekeeping. Also, again, a thank you this, to Dispute Bebo for actually organizing the events. Uh, now there's some time for a Q&A. If you have a question you want to ask Dr. Newby, please raise your hand under participants if you want to post it yourself or send me a message if you want me to ask it in your name. Uh, I would like to ask you to stay a minute after the Q&A for some short announcements. And now I will give the floor to the first person who raised their hands, uh, uh, Bama Vira. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but the floor I is yours. I'm closing up. <laughs> I'm closing up. <laughs> it's okay. Anyways, I would just like to uh, say that first of all, a uh, wonderful lecture, thank you very much. Thank On you. a more practical note, uh, the uh, website page where you can sign up for, you know, for the organization, the network, I just went there and the form is closed. So, <gasps> oh, I thank cannot you. Right now. <laughs> just letting you know, know what we had problems with Google Forms. They've just yes, told sir. us at the university we're not allowed to use them because they're not secure or something. So I'll have I... a word with my. Yeah, thank you. I don't need to use Qualtrics for that, I guess. That's right. That's what we need to do. I will uh, bug my. Yes, thank you very much. Very useful. But you, you had a question a long time ago, Bum. So what is it? Ah, uh, just a lot of comments along the way. Uh, I actually kind of forgot about it, but I guess it's all right because I think that was covered eventually, I think. Or at least it was implicitly implied that I can see the point coming, so it was fine. Yeah, that's why I thought it's probably better to save it to the yeah. end just because of that, because, you know, I, I, I get, like, it's it's a big topic as well, so I thought, oh, I hope no, I, I carried you along. <laughs> yeah, I remember now, during the... Uh, demo the discussion about the mobilization, disarmament, and reintegration process. Because we had something around 2006 and, you know, up to like 2010 and still quite ongoing with transitional justice in Nepal, because we just had a civil war back in 96 to 2006. And we, we saw exactly that when, you know, during the reintegration process that a lot of women and also some children were obviously for the children were considered unlawful combatants and therefore were 100% excluded from the reintegration process, meaning that they could not join the uh, national military after retraining. They did not get, you know, due compensation for, you know, conflict, you know, for the cost. And even, even till now, a lot of the, uh, you know, we had issues with the accountability tra trail, meaning that a lot of the uh, wartime violence, whether that be general or sexual in nature, actually have gone uh, unaddressed simply just because we uh, frankly have no evidence so to speak of. So it's just something I, I just wanted to raise that, you know, it's a, that, you know, anecdote with the DDR process that, you know, it's something I saw in person. Thank you. Um, and that I'm really glad you, you brought that up and that you remembered um, to, to bring that up. Yeah, I mean, it does seem to, I mean, Sri Lanka too, I'm sure you know, ah, has enormous issues with that as well. And there's some fantastic scholarship by South Asian scholars on this. Um, uh, oh, I've cited it all in a paper I've got coming out, but unfortunately it's part of a special issue, so it probably won't come out for another three months. But if you're interested, I'm happy to send you, uh, I'll send a, a draft to... Um, uh, Yana or whoever, um, if you have any interest in that topic, I can send you the unpublished version, the sort of preprint 
Um, Please do. I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's it's a no. Thank you. It's and thank you for bringing it up because it's just such a huge this invisible the invisibility of of women um, mm -hmm. um, in these conflict zones. And as you say, it's, you know, once once the war and this, and this comes back as well, of course, to women's involvement, right, in 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 peace and 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 and, and peace negotiations. Because the argument also is, even if it's, oh, there's not enough qualified women from UNHQ to manage the process, there's another side mm -hmm. of it, which is like, oh, but, you know, we need to get all the combatants in the same room. And that's mm -hmm. always at the expense of the people who have probably suffered the most, which is usually True. women and, and children. Yeah, women, children, yeah, non-combatants. Yeah, yeah, it's, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, yes. I'll say something more, but later on, let's see if anyone else has something to say. I'll be back. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, then the next person was Danique. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, thank you very much for your lecture. I really appreciated it. Um, you mentioned that like female peacekeepers, they have access to, um, well, women's spaces in Orthodox societies. Uh, and that's like a huge advantage for them. But I was also wondering um, if you can tell maybe a little bit more on how men in Orthodox societies respond to uh, a female peacekeeper. And if like in that field, maybe female peacekeepers face uh, obstacles. Thank you, great question. Well, here's the funny thing. I mean, it's not funny, ha ha, but um, a lot of the research until recently has been predominantly on white women. So for example, Annika Kronsel's work and Bergman Rosamond's was, you know, they all looked a bit like me. I mean, younger and better looking, but you know, blonde hair, blue eyes. So in certain societies, certainly in the Middle East, I think I, you know, there's, of course there's interest because you look different. And um, there are other cultural reasons why they might think you're uh, amenable to speaking. But so, so for example, my research, there's a whole intersectionality issue is basically what I'm saying as well. And there's not enough work yet being done on how people from different cultures um, uh, are treated. So, for example, my work was in South Lebanon, where, how do I put this delicately? There are very negative views ascribed to certain nationalities. Uh, it's not something that I'm uh, happy about at all. And I have asked this of some female peacekeepers to say, look, you know, how, how, how do they respond to people who are uh, possibly women of color or different uh, nationalities? And the answer gets a lot more fuzzy. So all I would say is like, the research we have so far is that men from conservative cultures have no problem talking to women and tend to treat them like honorary men. So they sort of say, okay, well, you're engaged with this peace operation. So I'm just gonna treat you pretty much like one of the guys. Um, but what we don't know, but as I say, the majority of those women have been uh, Anglo-Saxon. Um, so it's a very skewed, um, and you know, given that the African Union does a great deal of peace operations and women are well represented in, in, in African militaries in many cases, I think there needs to be a lot more work on understanding uh, that, that dynamic because it'll tell us more about what's actually going on rather than a very narrow segment. Like most of the work's been done in Afghanistan really, uh, which is, yeah. Um, but certainly, as I said, my experience um, of traveling around the Middle East is that there was no shortage of men and women who, who wanted to, to talk to you. Um, so yeah, you just, it was much easier. Um, especially when I was just traveling, you know, but in terms of actually being a peacekeeper as a soldier, yeah, um, still no inhibitions. But the intersectional issue needs a lot more work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope that answered your question, Danique. Uh, then I would like uh, Bart to post his question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Anna, and also thank you, Dr. Nubi, for your wonderful lecture. Um, so, um, what stood out to me was one of the questions you posted on the last slide. Um, how do we treat everyone, everyone equally, yet accommodate our differences? Yeah. Um, and this also um, overlaps a bit with the previous question about intersectionality in our feminism. And um, so, I was curious about 
curious about whether there has been any prominent scholarship on um, the treatment of gender and sexual minorities and disabled people in um, the military and most importantly, peacekeeping uh, for this lecture. Uh, yeah. Um, I have not got into the LGBTQI literature. I know that it exists and I would direct you to the International Feminist Journal of Politics where that's a, a big concern. Um, it's very understudied. I mean, we've had the whole don't ask, don't tell sort of stuff from the US, but I actually don't know um, because I think it relates back to, again, national militaries. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question in terms of, you know, homosexual behavior in peace operations. That's a great area to explore. Like it would be pretty hard to research, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, probably to my knowledge, and as I you know, caveat at the beginning, this is a very deep area. So there could be somebody working on that right now. I hope there is, but I'm not aware of specific authors that I can throw at you. I'm thinking, no. So like with the intersectionality thing, look at, look at LSE, look at London School of Economics, uh, Gender Center. You've got people like Marsha Henry, She's great. She does the, 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 a lot of the race stuff, but like they have a lot of uh, gender focus there. So I would, I, would, I, would, I would have a look there as well as the IJ, uh, I International Feminist General of Politics, I'm never sure, IFJP as well, um, and look that up. But a great question, um, and I wish I could give you more answers to it, um, but it's a big it's a big issue. And certainly the RFJP uh, recognizes it as a, as a major sort of issue that needs more unpacking. Um, then, Chaya Regina, please post your question, which is a beautiful name. I hope I pronounced it right again. Yeah, you pronounce it very Dutchy, but uh, it's Gaia. But thank you. I I'm used to that by now. But uh, well, first of all, um, thank you so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed the topic. and. I I actually have two questions. So the first one is related to the percentage that you showed towards one of the last um, slides. It was a 17% of women uh, referring about sexual assault. So just to confirm it, that's the number of uh, women arrested by male personnel within the militaries. Uh, no, that was women. That was a figure that I got from uh, Kareem and Beardsley's 2017 work, uh, Equal Opportunity Peacekeeping. Um, and that was in interviews with they conducted with women uh, in peace operations. So it was sexual harassment within the peace operation itself. So that could have been from their own battalion or someone else's battalion, because obviously, especially in the sort of civilian or, or, or in, on the base itself, it can come from that. If, if a lot of bases have more than one nationality uh, base there, so it uh, it wouldn't necessarily be within their own military. But I can tell you that my own research found that um, obviously that does definitely go on within battalions as well. Um, and the problem with all this is that it's treated often as a conduct. Uh, what's it called? Conduct and something uh, disorder. It's not even yeah, treated like becoming of a officer and gentleman. <laughs> well, yes, but the, the title, it is unbecoming, <laughs> but it's called uh, Conduct and Discipline or something, Discipline and Conduct. So sometimes those issues are treated like that as opposed to actually being called out for what they are. Um, so again, it's kind of, it's hard as well to track and the UN doesn't even have a name for it. Like they don't even recognize it officially. I imagine that that was the case and I was actually wondering if there is a higher number of female persona within the military, is there also a um, proportionate relation with a higher number of sexual, sexual assault towards women? Because on one side, if there is a greater number of women, more the chances potentially, but on the other side, male persona should also be get more used to work and behave with women and then just behave more decently and don't harass them. So I was wondering if there is this, um, proportional relation between those two data. And then the other question was related to, um, I don't know if you had the chance of presenting your, the results of your research um, 
to uh, gender also within the military or uh, decision makers. And I was wondering if you could present those results to them. What was their reaction, like a direct reaction to concrete results that you could find? Like what, what are the answers that they give? What, what is the explanation that they can give when put in front of um, data? Well, um, in answer to the second question first, and then I'll go back to the first one, um, I have not yet present, presented it to anyone in the military. Uh, I haven't been asked to yet. Uh, maybe that will change in time. Um, I know from my experience of presenting the findings uh, that I had on the UNIFIL mission to UNIFIL uh, prior to publishing my book, um, I got quite an interesting response. The more uh, the, the people who've been around in peacekeeping longer acknowledged were more happy to acknowledge but the ones who'd been around less were like no no it's not like this it's like this um so presenting to your findings to the people that you're researching can always be a, a really interesting experience <laughs> um, i mean i thought it was quite positive overall but um but you know people it, it's a bit like if you've ever been a management consultant you know the companies get management consultants in and they say oh you know we want you to fix us. And then when you tell them what's actually wrong with it, oh, no, 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 that's not the problem at all. So they don't actually want to solve their own problems. So um, I think I could tell them that. I know that anecdotally, whether or not they'd listen would be another thing. But I know that, I mean, I've read quite a few books in the course of this research by, as I say, female officers. And I also was speaking to someone in the military not long ago. And it might have been the person I interviewed, as I said, uh, the Australian but they went, they went on secondment from the Australian military uh, to the US military. And the US military in particular, and this actually starts to relate to your first question, is, is very bad for sexual harassment and incredible, well, well, actually all out rape, and it's not reported. So the problem as well is that when you ask that first question about, you know, well, does it go up? We, we won't know because so many women I mean, there was a US Senator, Sally, um, I can't remember her surname, came out uh, a couple of years ago, you know, and, and, and announced she'd been raped and had never mentioned it until then. So um, it's just so underreported. But from what I can tell, um, it's pretty bad. Um, but whether or not it's proportional and at what point it becomes normalized. So you have, you have authors like Joe, I think it's Joe Nacker, who write about institutions in general and who say, once you've got 30%, women in an institution, you will start to see some kind of feminist agenda taking place. Now, I think in, the na in, in national militaries, that is, that is incorrect. Um, first of all, because they're very patriarchal organizations and very resistant to change. And second of all, because a lot of the women who join the military just want to fit in. They don't necessarily want to raise a feminist agenda in their perspective. Yeah, you know, they're just trying to fit in. So all of which is to say, we don't know in terms of uh, whether or not it raises, and we don't know what the level is where women's presence become normalized, where you would then start to see a sharp decline, presumably, because it's, it's become normal. Um, so, the, but certainly the anecdotal stuff that I read um, is, 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 is it's not good, but I don't know uh, I suspect that's US military culture, potentially. We don't know if that pertains to all military cultures and whether or not there is that kind of inferential statistical relationship, which would be very interesting. But yeah. thanks, great questions. Oh, if I may contribute. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Because there's like, you're talking about anecdotes about, you know, with roles of leadership culture and, you know, sexual violence in the military. Yes. If you. If you don't, if we have the time, I could, you know, you know, pitch in two cents. If not, we can just, you know, keep going. What do you want, Madam? There's room for one final question, I would say. Okay, one final question. I'll, I'll come to that later. Thank you. Oh, right. Um, um, was your question answered? Chaya? Sorry, I didn't know who you were referring to. Anyway. <laughs> Me too. Oh, thank you. No, thank you so much, really. Thank you. And yeah, actually, the point of the very best situation in the in the US, I think is very topical because in the last months that there have been um, many and many women within the militaries in the US speaking up and being very angry because 
uh, after the trials that their uh, perpetrators had, um, they got away with a with an accusation for you know misconducting and like bad behavior, just a bit of a scolding, but not a very serious punishment or not even put away from the military. So the case that you were saying, maybe we don't have precise numbers now. Many women are staying silent that it happens so many so often. Um, but the cases are there and I hope there will be more investigation on that in the future. Yeah, I mean, national militaries and I mean, the UN itself, like the, the sexual exploitation and abuse, which relates only to peacekeeper abuse of the local population, not peacekeeper abuse of other peacekeepers, which is why I said they don't even have a term for it. Um, it's just, as you will know, notoriously under, I mean, there's like 90% of cases are still pending and, you know, states just don't want to follow up on them and the UN doesn't want to push. The, the fact that the US military, as I say, one of the other anecdotal uh, things I was told was, yeah, by this soldier, he's, his friend was going over from, and he said, you better take a knife with you. He said, because literally don't sleep without a knife there. That's how bad the reputation within other militaries was about being a woman in the US military. Um, and I mean, it's tip of the iceberg, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the day, that's in a, well, I mean, now Trump's gone, we can say kind of a democracy again, um, although there are people doing their best <laughs> to uh, change that. But um, I mean, in other parts of the world, you know, is it any better? Is it worse? We, we just don't know. It's, uh, it's really problematic. Thank you so much. You're welcome, great question. Thank you for that great uh, question and answer. So then there's room for one final question. So go ahead. That's you, Bob, I think. Is there anyone else that wants to uh, ask something because it's not like critical, it's just like more anecdotal observations because I have some like something to uh, put to that discussion. Mm. Anyone want to ask anything else? Because if so, I'll just, uh, I'll just turn off. Well, no hands seem to be raised. There was no okay, question. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put in some, uh, some of my uh, observations then because if the question of, uh, you know, of the leadership culture and discipline and the resulting, you know, wartime sexual violence, whether that be uh, towards local populations or within the, uh, the uh, battalion itself. Mm. <laughs> One second, I'll be back quickly. So, oh, by the way, while we're while we're waiting, um, Yana, if, if I can send you that reference uh, to that art, I'll send my unpublished article. I'll also resend the link once it's fixed for the membership of Wise. Um, and do do ask me if if you need anything else. Uh, if anybody's asked for anything else, I can send it. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, I just took the opportunity while we we're waiting. So, yes, yes, mm -hmm. your observation. Okay, so I'm gonna take us back a little bit to like 1996, some, something like, like that during the Nepalese civil war, because we, uh, we observed something quite, you know, similar to uh, what we see with, you know, like the American military as versus other, you know, maybe in this case, more like Commonwealth leadership culture, let's say for example, in the British, or like, and to extension also in Nepalese, because we have, you know, <laughs> we have a bit of a connection with the British there in terms of like, you know, the, the leadership core. Well, back in like the 90s, before the Civil War, the army, the Nepali army was only about 30,000, you know, strong, mostly a ceremonial force or, you know, some foreign you know, deployments with the uh, UNPKF here and there, peacekeeping force here and there. So it's very, quite small. Currently, it's around like, we stand at about 100,000 active with 50,000 reserve. But thing is, during the uh, Civil War, we uh, peaked at around 150,000, and that's just the army proper. This is not including the other paramilitary, which is like the local police and the armed police, gendarmerie, APF, they call it. And what we see here is that the uh, leadership has like kind of like jumped from like, you know, the, the what I say, the more like the British standard to the American standard and back to the British standard. And it is during that ba massive ballooning of troop concentration during the war that we see the bulk of, you know, sexual violent incidents that have been recorded. And my, uh, at least my anecdotal uh, observation is that it really has to do with you know how we uh, this how you know troop leaders discipline and treat their their you know their their enlisted personnel because 
at least in my like observation, usually like in you know in Nepal, for example, whether we're in like the uh, national military or with the British Gurkhas, it is very very in in normal peacetime it's very hard to get in. So basically, people are self motivated to you know discipline themselves and you know keep this to be like a 20, 30 year career and you know retire with full pension and everything. So leadership leaders have a lot more latitude in treating people, whether that be men or women in their ranks, as equals and you know cultivate a more like symbiotic relationship with each other. Whereas in America, especially as of late, where recruitment has been a big issue, not just in women, but also in the general population, mm. is quite a bit more, let's say, uh, what's the word for it? It's, it's like nanny state. What's the word for it? <laughs> mm, paternalistic, paternalistic. Right. And it, it basically, they, they treat people like children. And I think that this has like quite a delirious consequence for in terms of violence towards women, whether that be uh, towards the local populations or especially within the uh, battalion itself. That's just my observation anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, no, that's interesting. What research have to be done? And uh, I think that is a very tempting research path. <laughs> I mean, from a British, I mean, it's interesting because I mean, I always a bit careful about saying this because the British Army perpetrated some really true. awful stuff. Yes, true. I'm, um, I'm, so, yeah. I, I was being a bit loose. I meant more like a British Gurkha unit, which is a, a, a solely like a different thing, which is within the British Army and at large. I don't speak for like the uh, British Armed Forces at large because I have no like anecdotal experience with that only with the, uh, the uh, now the uh, conglomerated as a Royal Gurkha Rifles. But yes, please go ahead. You are totally right with the uh, violence. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I take your point and, and I'm the same. I sort of, you know, I've always, from what I understand of the British Army, it was seen as more of a profession. Um, and mm -hmm. so they're much fussier about who they take. Um, yes. And if you ever watch old British series, yes, Prime Minister, uh, when the Prime Minister suggests uh, that the British Army start conscription again, and the British Army is, officer is horrified. <laughs> and he's like, we can't have the riffraff running around Sandhurst. So, yeah, whereas in America, it is much more of a, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, and it's also a, a socioeconomic uh, issue. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. Interesting. Would you like to give some final uh, remarks, Dr. Newby? Well, I just want to thank you all for sticking with it on a, you know, on a Friday, uh, what is it, a Monday night, uh, an hour and a half of me battling away. I've got to thank you all enormously for your uh, patience with me. Um, as you can tell, there was an awful lot more I would have liked to have talked about. And all this stuff really does link into bigger societal issues about, uh, about gender equality, what that actually means, what that actually looks like. And making sure, most importantly, I think my final comment is that it's, it can't be a zero sum game. It has to be a benefit to men and women, and we need men. So the men here in the audience, thank you again for participating. We need men to engage with this stuff. There's very few male scholars on WPS. We're seeing a few come in. But we need men to, to talk about you know, masculinity because masculinity is not a set thing. It is also very defined by a certain specific way of thinking, which is really problematic for an awful lot of men who feel they don't fit into that vision of what mas being masculine is. So when I talk about gender, I mean, one of the great gender scholars, Swati Parashar, she once, uh, I had the honor of, of her giving a, a teaching a class that I was, I was uh, coordinating in Australia. And she said, the first thing you've got to know about gender is it is not just about women, it's about women and men and how we can coexist on an equal basis. So, you know, I just want to stress that probably as my final point, just like, you know, you know, yes, women are disadvantaged, but we don't want to become advantaged wholly at the expense of men. We want to make sure that we get we do this together. Um, so that's my final, my final bit. And any other, anything else that you want, uh, anything I've mentioned, research or anything, just please uh, uh, get in touch with me, um, either personally or um, uh, through through Yana or whatever, and I'll be happy to uh, help or send you if I can. Thank you again, and also thank you to Bebo. And now I would like to give some short SIP-related announcements. Uh, firstly, the applications for the next board are still open, so if you're interested in that, do not